Thanks, everyone. I will just take a minute uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Daniel Hayes, who will chair the next session, and I will uh, ask him to uh, take over. Um, just to say, uh, yes, we're ready now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe, and a warm welcome to all of the people in the audience. So my name is Daniel Hayash, as Felipe said, and I am the a newly joined innovation manager for the Global Disability Innovation Hub. I'm very excited to chair this panel. And um, with that, um, I would like to also introduce our panelists. So today we have six extremely talented and extraordinary uh, people with us. The first on my list in no, no particle order is Klaus Höppner from the uh, Austrian Association for Blind and Vision Impaired People. Then we have Bernard Gira, who is the director of Innovate Now. Uh, that Kathy was mentioning before, so the um, startup accelerator in, in Kenya. Then we also have um, Pamela um, Molino Toledo, from the World Federation of Deaf People. We have Professor Aldo uh, Faize, who is a professor from Imperial College London, working on artificial intelligence and uh, neuroscience. And then we also have Yulia, um, Yulia from G3ICT uh, joining us, who is working on smart cities as a senior project manager. And we also have Susan uh, with us. Susan is joining us from business disability as a executive director. Um, okay, so the format for this panel is that we have four questions in the line. The first three I would like to address to uh, some parts of the panel. And uh, the last question will be to all panelists. And I would like the panelists to kind of take roughly, you know, four or five minutes to discuss, after which I'll, I'll uh, offer a brief reflection from my end, and then we'll move on to the next question. All right, so if, if uh, people feel ready, I've, I've heard and I've seen in the chat, there has been some technical difficulties. Sharon, has everybody resolved? Can we proceed with uh, the first question? Uh, yes, please do. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, so um, my first question will be to uh, Bernard on the first place but also to Aldo. And it's a very simple introductory question on, you know, to please share some examples through your work in, in ways that um, artificial intelligence driven technologies um, have opportunities and challenges for disabled people. So maybe start with uh, uh, Aldo, if that's all right. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me onto this panel. I think this is a very important topic that we're seeing here uh, being brought to the forefront. So I think AI has unique opportunities in helping to deal with the unmet need for care that uh, uh, we require these days to, to meet the demand from the actually very rapidly rising degree of disabilities that we're seeing. We're not talking just uh, you know, disabilities of, of, say, motor disabilities or sensory disabilities, their learning disabilities. We have now a quarter of school children coming to university with some form of learning uh, disability. And of course, uh, there are also um, disabilities of, of, of the mind in that sense that we need to uh, consider. I think on the other side, what we require to do to unlock uh, what we can do with AI is to bring the people who are actually affected by a form of disability into the development cycle, into the research work to help shape what they actually need. 
And, uh, and later I'm going to show some examples of how we've done this in the past. But I think this idea, so to speak, of the technologist who has a disability and starts solving actual practical problems um, uh, from, from a first person perspective, I think it's key. So either you need to think about interdisciplinary teams, which brings in um, people for whom you're actually developing the technology, or actually in an ideal world, bring in the people themselves, enable them to give them agency to develop technologies. I think that's what we really need in terms of uh, if you want to bring AI or other forms of technology into uh, the field of disabilities. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Aldo. That's that's very comprehensive. Bernard, can I ask you uh, what, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I, I hope you can hear me well. I'm in a bit yes. old, so there might be an echo. So thank you as well. Uh, really privileged to be part of this great discussion. So I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and as Kathy mentioned before, you know, I'm running the Fast Assistive Tech Accelerator. And one of the ways, you know, we've seen AI being used in the assistive technology space is obviously to try and bridge uh, the inclusion gap for uh, the various forms of disabilities. And one example I can give is this uh, very um, you know, young company that currently mentioned. Uh, this young uh, entrepreneurs are building, you know, AI uh, you know, to bridge the gap between those who can sign and those who cannot uh, sign. Uh, and I think it's interesting to kind of appreciate you know, the challenges of trying to build AI for some language. Um, and one of the areas of interest here is how do you actually train you know, the, the, the data sets and algorithms to do a multiple sign language uh, interpretation? As we know, uh, sign language is, is really a, a, nat a national flavor. Uh, and you have you know, sign language literally in every other country. Uh, and, and, and I think one of the challenges we've seen entrepreneurs uh, deal with here is how to train those algorithms so that they can be diverse and, and how to access diverse data sets uh, on a sign language, you know. Um, but of course, there's tremendous opportunities here, uh, you know, to bring a sign language uh, as a catalyst for assistive technology. The other uh, example I wanted to talk about is basically in the accessibility space. And I think all of you have noticed how uh, you know, big, big tech companies, for example, like Twitter or, or uh, LinkedIn, have tried to bridge the gap for accessibility. And some of them are really trying to use uh, you know, uh, AI and training algorithms so that they can um, help accessibility features to be more obvious, which is very much needed. Uh, in the tech space, because we do have um, you know, technology that has accessibility features, but a lot of the times this is hidden or it's not obvious uh, to the user. So there is immense potential here uh, to look at AI as a catalyst for both accessibility and also assistive technology. And I think we've just started to see what can be done. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more. Um, and I think. You know, some of the issues we can touch on later are things like privacy, which is a big uh, uh, area of discussion when it comes to AI-driven assistive uh, technologies. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Bernard, and thanks again, Aldo. That's that's really uh, interesting and a very good starting point. And um, I, I was really curious to hear what Aldo was saying about, um, you know, the agency, because um just speaking from the uh, perspective of of um blind experience is that you know we need we need something stable to know our environment including digital environment like a folder structure and you know some ways for example AI yeah, could be used or is used is to cleverly find out what was your most recent item that you accessed and put it in very helpful in the top of the list but that that don't to some extent, partly can take away from the agency of, of uh, you know, your, your whole system and your control over it, but also it can place a barrier. You know, like sometimes the, the example I'm thinking about is every time you walk in the living room, imagine some sort of uh, AI would just reconfigure where your sofa and desk is and 
as a blind person or or even you know anybody else with any other form of disability might uh, find it quite um, difficult to to then um, feel comfortable in that system. But um, yeah, so let's um, let's just um, carry on a little bit, and and that's partly linking with my uh, living room example, perhaps not not very brilliantly, but it, it does link. And I would like to specifically address this question to to Yulia, if if that's all right. And what I would like to ask you is um, mostly to do with built environments. So Yulia, could you tell us and, and the audience, please, um, how is artificial intelligence and machine learning um, linked with the, the built environment and how could it be used to improve the urban mobility for people with living with uh, disabilities? Thank you, Daniel. Um, well, we know that uh, nowadays technologies are very tightly connected to anything in the built environment and uh, this physical world, uh, world and virtual world they get together uh, in, in a greater scale than any, any time before that. And uh, in our experience in the project that we implement together with Microsoft and the University of Washington, we are actually using the power of machine learning, the power of AI, uh, the open data to improve the situation with the built environment and mobility in uh, specific countries, specific cities. Uh, this project is dedicated to collecting the data about the sidewalks in five cities in Latin America. And mm -hmm. by collecting this data, we are actually learning a lot about how people move around the city and whether they are able to move in certain areas of the city. Uh, this data will then inform the, uh, the tool uh, which is created by the University of Washington, uh, uh, which is called Open Sidewalks Map. This helps uh, people with disabilities to build their way around the city uh, using their uh, settings by those people, like the incline or decline, the, whether they need uh, curb ramps or they can go without them. Uh, this tool will help them to build the way, to build the path from point A to point B, uh, taking into account all their needs, what uh, each of them might require from the accessible route. This allows not just to assume that this or that street is accessible. We want to know that this or that street is accessible to a specific person. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this allows to uh, collect the data, which can be used by the city, not only for this specific uh, goal to make the, uh, the path, the, the route uh, building for persons with disabilities more easy, but it can inform their further decision on the mobility, uh, on uh, building the uh, uh, streets or building the sidewalks where they don't have the sidewalks at the moment. Uh, it, it can inform them about where they have the traffic lights, uh, how they need to improve those traffic lights for the sake of the whole population, not just persons with disabilities. So we're trying to make sure that the uh, data collected can benefit the uh, built environment for the sake of everybody. Wow, that's, that's really impressive and you know, sometimes we don't really think about, or person, I don't think about how many different ways AI and machine learning can be used as brilliant. And it also reminds me when you mentioned sidewalks, and the first thing that comes to my mind is we have this huge issue in the UK about um, um, shared spaces. So basically where, you know, curbs are, are taken away and, and essentially the uh, cyclists, the cars and the and pedestrians are all kind of sharing the same space. Which is, a, which is a huge issue for, for example, uh, guide dog owners and, and uh, even, you know, long cane users in the blind community. And, and it just raises the whole, uh, you know, set of different questions. And, and maybe that's where I can also see um, your work come into play. So thank you very much. That's, that was very interesting. Okay, so let's see the last of the three questions that I would like to address to, to some specific panel members. And, and this one I would like to 
uh, have some insights from um, our members, panel members from uh, organizations working with or working for um, people with disabilities in, in particular. Uh, I would like uh, Klaus to, to think about this question, Pamela and, and Susan as well. So the action is, um, sorry, not the action, the question is, is really to think about, you know, what, um, um, what are some of the concerns that um, AI uh, poses, especially in the um, you know, intersection of uh, disability and AI in terms of bias? So, you know, really what, what should be uh, look out for in terms of bias? And maybe if we start with Klaus and then go to Pamela and then uh, to Susan. Thank you very much for having you, for having me with you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm representative of an DPO uh, and we are working with people with disabilities and we are trying to find out how uh, artificial intelligence can help us by covering the needs of the of these of these kind of, uh, of of population of the 15% that we are missing now in the in the discussion we have seen it here in in Europe with the discussion of the of the white paper where persons with disabilities are not mentioned for example uh, but there was also this artificial uh, intelligence higher level experts group where we had the possibility to bring in the needs of persons with disabilities. In the case of, in, in, um, now let's, let's start from another way. Yeah? Uh, we asked persons with disabilities within the framework from the EDF, what are their, their concerns? Their concerns are the lack of accessibility, the lack of standardization, and the lack of interoperability. They, these are the three uh, biggest concerns that, that they have uh, using artificial intelligence products, services, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and the bios that is in the product or in the data. Uh, we see we have seen so many uh, examples. For example, I think Susan Scott Parker will will now uh, will tell us about uh, hiring process uh, bias that we have, for example. Uh, but there are also other examples uh, which we have seen where we have seen the bias is in the data uh, and could be used by, for example, big companies, especially by insurance companies uh, to classify uh, the population into person with disabilities and person without disabilities and to adapt their tax rates or their rates uh, according to this classification. Uh, and that's the big concern that they have. Uh, what, what can we do to, to solve this problem? Uh, I, I think one of the, it was mentioned before, uh, one of the main things that we can do is uh, include the person with disabilities in the design process, uh, ask them what they need because they need the best, uh, they, 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 not they need, they, they, uh, they know the best what they need. Uh, and the data that we collect is not uh, what it is, but it should be what it should be. Uh, and uh, the other thing here in Europe that we have uh, with the mass data, it's always this restri restriction with the uh, GDPR, with uh, privacy. Uh, we have to follow the restrictions that are within the framework of the, of the GDPR here in, in, in Europe. But I think this could be also an advantage and not a disadvantage. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's that's very interesting. And um, so you you talked uh, you know a little bit about uh, the EDF in, in general. Do you, do you think these um, you know, some of the concerns that you mentioned are are general generalizable? Uh, for example, to to you know, most or all disabilities, or is there anything specific to, to potentially um, the the blind community? No, I don't think it's specific for the blind community. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the biggest problem is that we have to be, um, we have to, to build up trust. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, yes. And how we can build up trust. Uh, yesterday, I've been on a panel where they, are, where they were talking about uh, building up trust by certification. Uh, and certification means that you have to have some standards. Uh, mm -hmm. I know this is a big issue because people are telling me, okay, uh, development uh, is going too fast uh, to make standards. But you can see it on a global level, on an ISO level with the JTC1, SC42, for example, uh, that they want to try to build up some standards uh, which are globally, well, uh, uh, globally available for, for all persons then. Sure. Thank you, Klaus. We, we might be actually coming back to the, the question of standards and, and uh, what we can do in, in, in a moment. Um, Pamela, uh, can I ask you the same question? What's, what's your opinion about our you know, concerns in terms of AI and, and disability? Anyone, okay. anyone on the panel? Oh, okay. All right. No, I was... I yes, sure. hi, 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 hi. First of all, I want to thank everyone for welcoming to this panel. Uh, like I was, we were talking about the first thing that's very important that we need to um, realize is when we are having this dialogue about inclusive um, intersectionality, we must also think about um, what we call privilege. Yes. So therefore, that's the first thing, that's the for first barrier to have this, to be able to have the access. I don't think that AI needs to be at the same level uh, or at the same standard of standardized. No, no, I don't think it should be standardized. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for all people. Therefore, the first thing is that when we start building this or creating this AI, we need to talk to people with disabilities. They tend to do this very little. They don't talk to the deaf. They don't need to do anything. It's very minimal, our input, if not non-existing. We are very creative. So this creativeness or perspective uh -huh. is done without the people with disabilities, outside the, the people with disabilities. They're thinking for us. Um, right. Our, the AI is being invented for the deaf people. Um, and it's very, it has a very odd autism viewpoint. Many organizations can access or have places to talk about this because they don't have, they don't talk, they don't go, they, first of all, they don't speak English. Um, how do they communicate with all these people that are creating all of these AIs? Um, the focus groups, we don't have access to this. So there's no accessibility. There's no sign language involved in this. So there's a lot of barriers to people with disabilities confront. Also, most of this AI that are for the deaf people, again, it's very, we have, it's very limited. The purpose is probably to um, replace a sign language interpreter with an avatar, right? That will do some signing. Uh -huh. Now, the, that will listen and will produce something. The problem with that, however, is that, again, it's very audioism. It's a very stamp viewpoint of audioism. Technology is cannot just be a one-way communication. It has to be a two-way communication. And it needs to be, they need to have us involved in this. Um, then they cannot say, oh, look, we created all of this AI for you if you're interested. No, we need to be part of this discussion, not an afterthought. We're not there, they're not there to help us. It's not, it's to create a voice for a sign language to help you. The hearing person is saying that to the deaf person that I use sign language. No. And then when it doesn't do the voicing from the sign language, then the service itself is not 
useful. So then we're back to the beginning. Yes, yeah. thank you so very much. The problem, and there's other problems as well. We have someone that does a sign glove. That's not an issue for the hearing person to communicate with the deaf. That's perfect. But when the deaf wants to communicate with the hearing, then that's a problem. So these programs are very hearing viewpointed oriented. The other one we have is um, understand we have about 2000 different sign languages all over the world. We cannot make one. We cannot make one avatar to meet all of those different sign languages. The 200 sign languages, it's not a one, one tailor fits all. And those are all the challenges that we need to think about. The other one is also that's very important is that artificial intelligence um, must, must have goals of being independent and autonomy, not to naturalize or normalize. Yes. And make him as, as if you're a hearing person, <laughs> right? Or having a hearing person perspective. For example, we have what we call a VP and a VRS, video phone and video. A lot of these companies do not have these services. It's not globally video relay services or captionings, right? Right, or the captionings. Now, when there's conferences and presentations, we do have captions, but they're only in English. These captions are not in all these other languages. Now, we might have all these, a few options, but we don't have all the options that the globe has. And we don't also provide services for, for, for people that are outside the city limits. There's no services for the, the internet. Um, so we have all of these um, barriers that we need to confront in our developing countries. How do we get across? How do we get um, to those? How do we get to people who live in the urban, um, um, rural areas? Um, yes, and that's that's um, lots of uh, lots of well. difficult questions. If 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 I may just. Uh, Stop you there, Pamela, because I heard loads of exciting things that I think feed in very well in the last questions around, you know, how what we can do as, as academics to improve things. So if you keep those in for just a, a few more minutes and, and, and before we get there, I would like to just uh, offer Susan as well a, a few minutes to 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 mention, you know, as in her experience, what you know, what, what are the, the potential um, you know, challenges we have to attend to as, um, you know, you know, AI bias in terms of disability. Susan, what, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Well, as Klaus said, I'm going to focus on the employment front, really. <clears throat> what we're now seeing is that AI-powered recruitment and HR technology threatens the life chances of hundreds of millions of persons with disabilities worldwide. But we've also got the fact that the need for fair, ethical and responsible treatment of the world's more than 1.3 billion persons with disabilities is not on the responsible AI agenda. Neither the developers nor the organizations that buy and or deploy these technologies, despite all the talk about bias, are asking about disability bias, nor are they discussing the disability discrimination triggered by how these tools are used. In fact, I would argue disabled people are so missing from this debate that no one has even noticed they aren't there, which is why I was so pleased to be invited today. If we look at the thousands of AI powered recruitment assessment tools now on the market, neither their content, their usability, their accessibility, nor their accuracy has been validated for job seekers or employees with disabilities. Nor are these products required to be grounded in learning about how to make adjustments or accommodations which make equality possible for people with disabilities. You just have to consider the video interviews that use AI to assess your personality from your eye contact, facial expressions, word choice, voice pattern, nonverbal communications to compare with their successful or ideal employees. If we could have, if we had time, I could just itemize all the ways in which people with disabilities are discriminated against in that very process. I would urge everyone here today to actually check out the research from the Bavarian broadcaster showing that a candidate's personality scores can change up and down from 10 to 20 points 
just by wearing a headscarf or putting a painting in view of the camera. So just imagine the impact on your level of neuroticism points or your conscientiousness score if the camera saw your non-standard arthritic hands, the crutches by your chair, or the fact that you're talking with a speech impairment. So because with time is short today, I just wanted to stress that these AI tools do not just reinforce the economic and social exclusion of persons with disabilities, far from it, many are at risk, but to highlight that the good news is we know that systems that work for extreme users work better for everyone. I think of disability in this AI debate as the discrimination litmus test. If women with disabilities can compete fairly for a job while navigating these AI powered processes, Probably everyone will find it just the much, that much easier to get through fairly. And so what I was going to say today, really, in terms of what needs to be done, the allies of people with disabilities and the disability rights movement need to raise the profile of this issue. We need to get disability into the worldview of those influencing this hugely important debate. It's not in there now. We have to do something. And so I'm hoping everyone here knows at least one significant influencer in the world of AI and starts to use what I'm calling the what about campaign. We need to start asking what about disability whenever race and gender bias is on the table for discussion. What about women with disabilities? What about ethnic minorities with disabilities? What about people who are transitioning from not having a disability to having a disability? What about, what about? And my final, call here, if you like, was to join me in calling for regulators to introduce alongside equality and human rights legislation, the CRPD agenda, the consumer protection we need, which would require developers to prove their products are safe for persons with disabilities, that they've taken all the reasonable steps they could, including, of course, bringing people with disabilities into the entire product development cycle, to ensure that these that consumer protection, which names people with disabilities explicitly is required before these producers can put these products on the market. It should be unlawful to sell an AI recruitment tool until you can prove it's not going to damage the life chances of people with disabilities. Agree or not? Thank you very much, Susan. So well put, so, so interesting. And one maybe common thread I hear from you know all of you, Klaus, Pamela and Susan, that really there there needs to be uh, participation from from disabled pe people regardless of what their disability but people need to um, you know the researchers and academics need to listen to and and the whole industry of, of AI needs to listen to the people living with disabilities and also there is lots of question about standardization there is you know potential value in, in making it custom to to people's needs. But then, of course, there has to be a fundamental, a huge amount of trust in the system. All right. So now I would like to move to the last question, and that's that's to all of you. And I suggest maybe we go in a in a similar or in the same order as as we've done the previous questions. So starting with Aldo, uh, Bernard, and, and so on, as we went throughout the panel. And the question for you here. And some of you already touched on this, but what do you think? What can academics and researchers do um, for the disabled uh, community in terms of artificial intelligence, especially focusing on that it becomes a process of you know, designing with and not designing for, for the people? So yes, Aldo, if, if you would just, uh, and all of you, if you could give me a, a two, maximum three minute uh, statement on this. So I, I think if you want to design with, you need to involve the target groups and you know their mechanisms by go engaging with uh, organizations for different disabilities, for example, and involving them. And that's how we started. But by now we've switched to a program uh, where we have both a master level program and a PhD program uh, where we're actually actively seeking members with disabilities to become agents of these technological transformations. Uh, and not just assistance of this transformation. And that has been actually going very well. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. That's really good to hear. Bernard, what's what's your experience on this question? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, I think, I mean, there's a couple of things here. Uh, one is the research is really powerful in terms of uh, catalyzing new solutions. So 
one of the things I feel that needs to happen immediately is we need to ask ourselves how quickly is a research turning around into practical solutions and, and, and getting in the hands of people who can build inclusive uh, solutions, inclusive tech. I think some of the problems I've had being mentioned on this panel, for example, with the AI recruitment, uh, HR solutions, that's, that's, that's really an interesting area to ask themselves. Well, how do you uh, build solutions that solve that problem? And I think, uh, you know, researchers and academics can really help entrepreneurs, for example, or, or, or the entrepreneurs themselves. I like this idea of GDI Hub, where there's research and practice together. And I think the most important thing as well is this idea of um, participation of persons with disabilities. And one of the things we've done at uh, Innovate Now is to build a network of disabled people who participate in the innovation process for anything that gets uh, supported as an innovation uh, meant to serve persons with disabilities. Uh, and of course, there's many things that we can do outside the bounds of research and innovation. But I feel like that's you know a, a winning marriage when you talk about research driving innovation, innovation driving products and services that are uh, more inclusive. Thank you. Yes, no, I, I totally agree. Very well said that the research and practice element is just uh, crucial. What about um, you, Yulia? Um, what's your take on what can academics and researchers do to make the process more inclusive? Well, I will probably go with three points here. <laughs> so the, the first one uh, will be about uh, data divide. It is something that we see across the world in different parts of the world uh, in operations by the companies, by the cities, by the states. And we see the problem that uh, uh, the data about persons with disabilities or produced by persons with disabilities is uh, almost absent in, in many cases. Uh, it is because either the companies and cities and administrations do not collect the information about persons with disabilities. And it means that they are not able to improve the situation because they don't know what is the current situation. Uh, and also they don't work closely with the uh, disability community to uh, collect the data from them, uh, to help them understand why this data will be available uh, for decision-making and work with them to uh, gather this data. Uh, the second point is about the project that we actually do. And uh, this is exactly what we are trying to implement in uh, all the projects of our global initiative for inclusive ICTs. We uh, work closely with the disability community uh, to make sure that all the innovations in the field of uh, information technologies are inclusive of persons with disabilities and uh, validated by them, that they work on those innovations, uh, they uh, understand how these innovations help them, they consult or guide other team members and they validate the result. Uh, and also the third point will be about actually the innovations. We had one of the projects which was specifically focused on inclusive innovations. And uh, during the kind of a small research, we found out that in many cases, the innovation ecosystem is not aware about what inclusive information and communication technologies are, what are the requirements and what are the features. And one of the problems is that they don't work with the community of uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, and one of their recommendations or even prerequisites for this work is to make sure that uh, persons with disabilities are actively involved in the process, that they are not the beneficiaries, that they are active participants. Mm -hmm. oh, well, well organized. I love it. And what I was uh, just thinking about, uh, as you were saying that, that, you know, it's interesting to see for example, from you know Aldo, that one way to to make this uh, inclusion process uh, 
and more effective is to bring in your master and, and PhD uh, students to, to work on, uh, on the actual uh, you know, AI development um, um, with, uh, with having disabilities. But then of course, on the other end, to make sure that the innovators talk to DPOs and, and, uh, and the disability community. So it's a, a very interesting um, two side. Okay, so let's see what uh, Klaus has has added to that. Yeah, I want to I want to steal some things from from Susan Scott Parker. Uh, I have four questions. What about the access accessibility in the university itself? What about universe? Uh, what about accessibility in uh, the curricula? What about mainstreaming of accessibility and inclusion? Uh, and the normal process of academic uh, forthgoing? Uh, and what about accessibility uh, in the education of the, of the professors and, uh, and, and uh, the trainers? Yeah. If we have okay. that, then mm -hmm. uh, we don't need any, any special, special debate about how to mainstream or include uh, accessibility uh, and disability uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, it must be uh, a normal thing uh, that accessibility and disability is recognized as a part of life, also at universities. I can see it here in Austria when, when people are not able to go uh, into university by wheelchair. Uh, but then they should talk about accessibility in front of uh, in front of an audience of two hundred persons, and they are not able to come into the into the into the place. So that's one of the one of the very very uh, curious curious things uh, uh, when we talk about disability and universities. Yes, I totally agree, Klaus. That's that's super. Uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head because sometimes we can. We can say great things about how something should be done, while you know within uh, our circles we, we sometimes don't actually excel in these processes. And once once we can find a way around that, that, that probably will help uh, in the whole ecosystem. Okay, Pamela, are you ready to uh, share your views on how academics and and researchers um, could improve the whole process of? designing with and not designing for disabled people. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think that the universities and um, researchers need to work in collaboration, in partnership with all organizations of people with disabilities. They have to. They have to establish that bond and that working relationship with these organizations. They need to work together and they need to educate people with disabilities of what innovation design is and the building of technology and AI, um, and perhaps set up some kind of curriculum within that university um, to bring in and have accessible and be accessible for people with disabilities, so they can be the more people can sign up and the advancement can 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 be championed working together with and collaborating with. So the universities, researchers, people with disabilities. Um, yes, there's a lot of universities without people with um, any disabilities. Um, and they're very resistant against disabilities. So therefore we have to learn to work together with them. The second thing is um, these researchers are, um, um, that, did they form like an assessment and working especially with a southern part of the, the world um, and people with disabilities all over um, um, that are vulnerable. Therefore, we need to find a way to collect all of this data that has already been collected or that needs to be collected and see how we can integrate this and get their perspective, especially in the CONASUR, um, and see what is going on so that they can help the community. And another thing, it's always, always diversifying. 
Yes, that's a very nice. Uh, uh, right. That's not- to, um, and and test, test test things out, test it out with the organization of people with disabilities. Um, work with, collaborate with, test it out with them um, before it's sent out. Before it's um, include the people with disabilities, include the organizations during the test periods. And lastly, I want to also offer that the universities and these an- analysts not forget about the deaf community. Um, the AI um, for the deaf community is not to help us hear, no. It is to help us live an independent life without even the, without the hearing and be very visual. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela. Very well said. It's not about making you hear, it's making you you know, have the life you, you would like to live. Excellent. So, Susan, finally, um, on to you with your expertise on, you know, unfairness. Um, what, what do you think academics and researchers could do? I'd like to add to Klaus's list and say, mm-hmm. why do we need to do, you know, remedial training for your HR graduates? Why do we need to do remedial training for your MBA graduates? I think starting to look at the need to look upstream at equipping the professionals who make the decisions, deploy this stuff, buy this stuff. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Second, please start to challenge the snake oil science. Science that claims that they can determine my level of neuroticism by whether I have a painting on the wall. The academics need to start to say, we know you're making money. We know you've got HR people who buy that stuff, but it's just not science. And thirdly, start to think as academics about not just bias, which is a kind of neutrally thing, but the bias that leads to injustice. Focus on the discrimination, the injustice, understanding the processes that these tools are are embedded in, that that they're delivering, if you like. You need to get a little less academically neutral and a little more purpose led here in terms of why are we even having this conversation? It's because people are, are, are losing out right now. And I don't see any academics anywhere with fire in their belly on this subject. I need it to be, of course, academically rigorous fire in the belly. But the point I make is, if you were to just take a broader view of the impact of these tools than just queries about bias in a statistical and data 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 sense, then I think that would be really helpful in the broader sense. Thank you, Susan. That's that's excellent, and you know I'm I'm just uh, immensely proud to to have uh, had this experience. You know, all six of you um, contributing to this discussion, and um, really I, I hear some some common threads. But I feel you know you know even just like seven of us here now has such a diverse input on on some of these questions. Um, is you know, like I see that, for example, Bernard was talking about research and practice, but also Susan was mentioning about, um, you know, just making sure that academics are a bit more um, staying in touch with reality. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's aspects about including the, the actual community, like Pamela and, and Klaus was saying as well. So so there's some, some really uh, thoughtful um uh, takeaway messages to, to take home. So we are coming uh, very much to the, to the end of this session. So I would like to thank one more time all of our speakers and, and panelists. So we had Susan uh, Scott Parker from Business Disability. We had Yulia uh, Sarviro from, from the G3 ICT uh, Consortium. Then we had Bernard Gira from Innovate Now, Aldo uh, Faisal from Imperial College London. And um, also we had Klaus Höckner from the Austrian Association of Blind People. And I hope I didn't forget anybody, but thank you very much for for all your inputs. Um, I wonder, Sharon, if we have a minute or two for questions from the audience. Uh, Well, we have two minutes uh, uh, till Aldo's uh, final talk, which um, which will be fantastic. This has been a really interesting panel. And I do think the big takeaway has definitely been inclusion, inclusion at the very concept stage, inclusion. And I think that's one of the reasons why we put on this event as well. We want to provide a platform for people to say what they need to what, what they need to say 
and to get their point across um, as individuals and to be heard. So it's wonderful to have so many people listening. Um, but I do think yeah, we do need to put it into action. Uh, uh, we're getting a lot of thanks from people in the in the chat about how important this topic is. Uh, also, great job for the sign interpreter. So thank you very much, Gerard. There. Um, uh, I don't know if there is any questions very quickly. Um, otherwise, we will move on to Aldo. But thank you very, very much for being involved. I do hope that something comes of this, that people would have the takeaway to um, make sure that they the focus groups are more inclusive and that when the research starts it starts with the people who they want to have as the end products involved in the very beginning meet meetings um, and at the beginning so thank you thank you very very much sharon um since, yeah. since i'm cutting into my own talking time by making an important point i post Please do. That. Uh, there are parents in here and i just want to tell you that if your kids are coming to study in the uk British universities, and I'm speaking as a former disability officer of my university, are required to make financially unlimited adjustments to enable your kid to study at our universities, subject to them fulfilling the core competence requirements, the document that every course in this country has. And you can look at that then, and if your kid fulfills the core competence requirements, and they can study, the university is required to make unlimited adjustments to adjust for that disability. So we have heard previously of a student, um, uh, Will, telling about his experience. And so uh, if Will had chosen, he could have in enforced unlimited adjustments. There was a case that went to court two years ago, three years ago, where a student could not attend the graduation ceremony because the hall that had the graduation ceremony uh, was not, didn't have a wheelchair ramp. And the court ordered the university to build a wheelchair ramp so the student could attend a normal ceremony and not have to get this diploma from the vice chancellor of the university outside the hall. So there is, things are in place. People need to be aware of that and we need to make use of that. Great, thank you very much. Um, so big thank you to all the panel members. Um, it was wonderful to have you here this afternoon. I'm going to make you a co-host, Aldo. I don't know if you've got screen that you want to share your screen or not, um, but we will move on to uh, our final presentation of the day, which is from Aldo Faisal, which is about AI for disabilities from uh, assistive technology.